Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites. In this video, I'm going to be showing you a method of making hollow carbon fiber parts, such as this wishbone or this air induction tube, by wrapping prepreg carbon fiber over a special low melt alloy core, then curing the carbon fiber before raising the temperature up and melting that mandrel out, leaving us with these incredibly lightweight, hollow carbon fiber structures. Now, this is not the most conventional way of making hollow parts. More commonly, you would be using a split mold with a vacuum bag or a bladder. And we have covered this process in previous videos, whether that's our split molding a tube video or the one where we produce a carbon fiber bike frame. But there certainly are situations where this method is particularly useful, namely, if it's difficult or near impossible to get a vacuum bag inside your component, or when it's the inside surface finish which is your main priority. It also has the advantage that on small components like this, this process really doesn't require any specialist tools or equipment, which certainly isn't the case for split molding. The way this is done is to start off with a shape or a pattern that represents the inside face of your finished component. Barriers are set up around this pattern and then silicon rubber is poured into the cavity. Once cured, the silicon mold is split and the pattern removed. We now have our silicon mold that can be used to cast the metal mandrel. A special low melting point alloy is poured into the mold and allowed to cool. The metal mandrel is removed from the mold and the prepreg carbon fiber is wrapped around it and then cured at a temperature below the melting point of the alloy. Once the prepreg is cured, the temperature is increased and the alloy is melted out, ready to be used again. So that's the process in theory. Let's now see how it's done in practice. I'll be demonstrating using these two different components. The reason for that is they use two different methods of consolidation. This air induction tube is primarily round in cross section, and so this is ideally suited to wrapping with shrink tape for the consolidation but that wouldn't work well for this wishbone component where we have much sharper corners and features that would be almost impossible to wrap. And so this really only leaves us with the option of vacuum bagging. So let's now take a look at how we go about making the patterns for these parts. The process starts out with a pattern. These patterns represent the inside form or geometry of your component, and that is worth bearing in mind, particularly if you have critical outside geometry. You'll need to offset these patterns to allow for the material thickness. Now, your patterns can be made from almost any process or material. This tubular component has been made on a 3D printer, whereas this one has been made from polyurethane model board. Now, I CNC machined this, but there would be no reason why you couldn't do this by hand. And actually, this process allows you to use almost any pattern making material, so woods and MDFs, or maybe you're just going to take your mold straight off an existing part that you already have. However you've made your pattern, the next step in the process is to create the mold. Now, we can use silicon rubber to create the mold because of the low melting point of these alloys and the relatively high surface temperature of silicon at over 200 degrees C means it's absolutely ideal. Now, to make a silicon mold, the first stage in the process is to create some barriers or dams around your component. Now, in the case of the 3D printed part, I've taken the opportunity to print these barriers at the same time. So these can simply be bolted around the pattern, leaving us with a very consistent cavity that we can pour our silicon into. Now, the offset that I've got here is 20 millimeters, and I would recommend a wall thickness on your silicon of around about 20 millimeters for most applications, as this is going to give your molds good integrity and hold their form without wasting excessive amounts of material. Now, if you haven't been able to 3D print your barriers like this, it's perfectly possible to make them very quickly and easily by hand. So we'll take a look at how that's done on this wishbone. For the baseboard and barriers, I'm going to be using polypropylene. Now, as we're making silicon molds, you could use almost any material for this and still get a good release. But I do find that polypropylene is particularly easy to work with. So to create the barriers, I'm just going to cut these down on our panel saw. And at the same time, I'm going to cut down an offcut of polyurethane model board to create some supporting blocks. I've also cut these pyramid features. Now I'm going to bond these onto the end of the pattern here. And what this is going to do is actually form a funnel into the part to make pouring the metal into this very small cavity that bit easier. I'm now sealing the pattern with a few applications of S120. Now this isn't strictly necessary. You would get a release directly from the model board with the silicon, but in sealing the surface, we will get a smoother, slightly more glossy surface. 
To attach the funnels, I'm just going to use some super glue, which makes a great job of bonding model board. The pattern needs to be suspended securely, so here I'm drilling and doweling the pattern to provide some additional support. Hot melt glue is then used to attach the pattern to the baseboard. Then the barriers can be formed and positioned. As the weight of the silicon will apply pressure to these barriers, I'm adding these blocks to buttress them at regular intervals. Once in place, a few spots of glue are used to tack it together before fully sealing the joints. These dams or barriers are going to be holding the liquid silicon, so it is very important to ensure that the glue has properly covered and sealed the joint. For the 3D printed barriers, I'm applying filleting wax to the flange to ensure that they are watertight once closed. For the mandrel moulds, we will be using the AS40 Addition Cure Silicon Rubber. This has a surface temperature of 250 degrees C, which is well beyond the melting point of both the LM95 and the LM138 alloys. First, I'll accurately weigh out the silicon and then the appropriate amount of catalyst. Next, I'll thoroughly mix them together for a few minutes, being sure to do so carefully and slowly, as this reduces the amount of air that's likely to get entrapped into the mix. If you do have a degassing chamber, then it is worth degassing the silicon to remove any of that entrapped air prior to pouring. But if you don't have one, then you could omit this step as it isn't strictly essential. The silicon can then be poured around the patterns and left to cure for 24 hours. Now that the silicon has fully cured, we can remove these barriers and then cut into the silicon to extract the patterns. Silicon naturally releases from most materials, so removing the barriers should be very straightforward. After a bit of a clean up, the moulds can be split. This is done with a scalpel knife. The method here is to splay the silicon and then take progressive cuts with a scalpel. You don't really need any precision when doing this. In fact, having a wavy and a regular split line is advantageous as it will register the halves together, helping them to align accurately. And so in silicon mold making, you will very often see these very intentional wavy lines cut into the silicon for this exact reason. Now that we have our silicon moulds, we can use these to cast our alloy mandrels using the LM95 alloy. Now this is supplied in one kilogram bars or ingots. We do also have another alloy, which is the LM138. And I will talk about that a little bit later. And whilst both of these alloys are cadmium free, the LM95 does have a lead content. So I will be wearing gloves whenever handling it. The amount of metal required to cast the core will of course come down to the volume of the part you're casting. Now if you work from CAD, your software is going to tell you this volume, but if you work from a handshape pattern or maybe an existing component, probably the easiest way to work out your volume is to simply fill the mold cavity with water and measure the amount required. Once you know the volume in litres for the LM95, you multiply this by 9.7 to give you the weight of metal you need in kilograms. In the case of these components, we have a volume of 0.3 litres for the air induction tube and 0.53 litres for the wishbone, meaning that they will need 2.91 and 5.14 kilograms respectively. As the alloy is completely reusable, it really doesn't matter if we melt slightly too much metal. So I will melt off three kilograms for the induction tube and six kilograms for the wishbone component. Because of the weight of this metal, it will put quite significant pressure onto your moulds during the casting process, which can separate your parting lines, causing a leak. So to prevent this from happening, you will need to keep these tightly clamped together. For the wishbone mould, I've got some flat plates and clamps ready that I'll use to press the mould halves together, which will prevent the silicon from being distorted by the weight of the metal. And for the tubular shape, I'll just use some zip ties. By placing these at frequent intervals down the mould, it's going to stop that mould from distorting and warping while it's being filled. Although the LM95 has a sharp melting point of 95 degrees Celsius, 
we'll be doing the cast at 130. This is to ensure that the metal will stay liquid throughout the pour and won't immediately solidify as it touches the cold moulds or just through general cooling while we're pouring it. Our OV301 benchtop oven has plenty of capacity for this sort of work, but melting of these alloys doesn't require precise temperature control, and so any type of oven could be used. With the oven set to 130 degrees, the metal starts to melt once it reaches 95. It then takes a further hour for all of that material to get up to the 130 degrees needed for the pour. The time it takes the metal to melt and reach full temperature will depend on the power of the oven and the mass of the metal. If you want to ensure that it has reached full temperature, then you can check this with a thermometer. Although LM95 does have some lead content, heating it to 130 degrees C is nowhere near the temperature required for lead to produce fumes. And so, with normal handling precautions, working with it in this way can be perfectly safe. If you did want to eliminate lead altogether, or you're working with a prepreg where the initial cure needs to be done at a higher temperature, then our LM138 alloy is a lead-free alternative with a melting point of 138 degrees C. With the metal at the required temperature, it's now time to cast the first mandrel. Now, it is a lot heavier than it looks, so do be prepared for the significant amount of weight. And make sure you have some good quality oven gloves which will allow you to grip the jug firmly. Next, we're casting the mandrel for the wishbone component. And as I mentioned earlier, this is very heavy material. And I will point out that six kilos of metal in a small jug took a lot of strength to lift and control. So for castings of this size, and certainly larger, you would want to split your metal into multiple smaller jugs. You can see here a very small amount of shrinkage is occurring as the metal solidifies. Once the alloy mandrels have cooled, they can then be removed from the moulds. The AS40 provides effortless removal and doesn't need any release agent. We now have our finished cast mandrels. I am really pleased with the accuracy and the finish that we've achieved on these. To prepare this wishbone part for the laminating process, I'm just going to trim off some of these unwanted casting features that we have. It is perfectly possible to do this process without using any release agent, so laminate straight onto these castings. Now, if you do that, you will get a thin film of metal left on the inside of the part. Now, this is very thin, and so it won't add a significant amount of weight, and if the inside of the part's inaccessible, it really isn't likely to be a problem. But if you do want to have a smooth carbon fiber in a surface, like I want on this induction tube, you will need to use a release agent. Now, I've experimented with lots of different types and found that by far the most successful and practical for this application is simple PVA release agent. Now, this can be applied by either spraying it, wiping it, or like I'm going to do today, brush applying it. When you're applying the PVA, all you're looking to do is build an even thick film over the entire surface of the part. Once this has been applied, you can set this to one side and leave it for around half an hour to dry. So while the PVA is drying, we can start preparing the materials for the parts themselves. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be using prepreg carbon fiber for the layup. The prepreg I'm using for both of these is the Xpreg XC130 system. If you're not familiar with prepregs, they're basically a form of carbon or glass fiber reinforcement where uncured resin has already been impregnated into the fiber. This resin can remain tacky for days or even months at room temperature, but will cure fully in only a few hours in an oven. I'll use a woven 210 gram in both the induction tube and the wishbone. And then I'll be using multiple plies of 300 gram unidirectional reinforcement for the wishbone where the strength is required. We have done many other videos using prepregs, so if you want to learn more about how to process them, do check out the links in the description. We have our kits of material cut so we can start on the layup. Now I'm going to start out with the induction tube and this just has a single ply of reinforcement because this is for a drone it needs to be incredibly lightweight so we're just going to have one single ply of 210 gram material. Now you'll notice that I haven't cut these to exactly the shape that they're going to need to be on the job. The reason for that is it's actually easier just to lay this down and then do the final tailoring actually while it's down over the mandrel itself. 
the first side is cut to size on the mandrel. And then the piece for the opposite side is applied, overlapped onto it, and then cut to size before being firmly pressed into place. Although this melt-out core method could theoretically be used with dry reinforcement and a hand layup or resin infusion, prepregs are intrinsically suitable because of their tacky, pliable format, which makes them easy to wrap neatly around the mandrels like these, and the resin systems used in them will generally be able to take the temperatures required to melt out these cores. And so prepreg really is the obvious choice. Moving on to the wishbone component, this is obviously far more structural, and so it's made up of multiple plies of reinforcement, starting off with a ply of woven 210 gram. Laminating around a mandrel like this is really no different from laminating into a mold. You still need to be very careful to get good consolidation into the corners, which traditional prepregging tools like these can help you to do. In case you were trying to work out what this wishbone is for, it's actually for a recumbent trike project, which is why the layup on this part is closer to what you might expect on a bicycle as opposed to a car. More complex geometries can be accommodated using cuts and overlapping sections. Layers of unidirectional reinforcement are now used to add the majority of the strength to the component in the direction that it's needed, before the final layer of woven 210 gram is used for the outer surface. Now it is very common to see unidirectional fibres sandwiched with woven cloth like this. Unidirectionals are prone to splitting or splintering in longer sections if used on the outer plies. So woven fabric just helps to keep those unidirectionals protected and bound properly together. Now that we've laminated the parts, we can go on and get them ready to cure. Now, I mentioned earlier in the video that we are going to use two different types of consolidation. For this tubular component, we're going to be wrapping this in a shrink tape, and that, when it's heated, will shrink down onto the carbon fiber, compressing it against the mandrel. But that technique won't work for a shape like this. The shapes and compound curves that we've got here and negative angles mean that a shrink tape simply wouldn't properly consolidate it. So for this, we're going to go down the route of a more conventional vacuum bag. When you wrap shrink tape, you need to maintain a reasonable tension and only progress at around about three millimeters per revolution. Once wrapped, it can then be secured with some flash release tape. We can now get on and vacuum bag the wishbone. Now the techniques I'm gonna be using here are fairly conventional. There is one difference that you will see in that we're not going to be putting a breather over the surface, but we'll cover that in more detail as we go along. First, we apply the R210 unperforated release film. This will very easily peel from the cured component and being very thin, any marks left by creases will remove easily during the finishing process. An envelope bag is then made with the VB160 bagging film. A piece of breather is placed under the through bag connector. In this case, I've opted not to extend the breather onto the component itself, as omitting it will tend to leave a smoother finish on the laminate, meaning that we will have less finishing work to do. The bag is then closed, sealed, a vacuum is drawn and checked. It is then placed into an oven and the initial cure conducted. This cure is done at 80 degrees for several hours. The exact time will depend on the prepreg system used, so please check the XPreg data sheets for further information. After the initial cure, the parts are removed from the oven and then the vacuum bag or shrink tape can be removed. Although the prepreg won't have reached its full cure at this stage, the resin will feel completely hard and the component will be structurally stable. We're now ready to put these components back into the oven, raise the temperature above the melting point and drain that alloy core out from the middle. Now when you're doing this, it is really important to support it in such a way that when the metal drains out, it will drain out into a container so it can be reused. For this part, I've got a lab retort stand which makes a really convenient way of clamping it. At this stage, the part is not fully post-cured, so it is important to raise the temperature progressively. By doing it progressively, you will not excessively soften the resin in the part. And I'm following the X-Preg post-cure cycle, which finishes at 130 degrees C. Once the alloy core reaches its melting point, which for the LM95 is 95 degrees, it will start to melt out. Often the metal will melt from the top down, 
meaning that you will get quite a dramatic emptying when the bottom finally melts. In industry, sometimes hot oil baths are used for this melt out, which can be useful to flush out the components, but generally a simple oven melt will be more practical. With the alloy melted out, we're now left with two incredibly lightweight hollow carbon fibre structures, but we're not done with these yet. In the case of this induction tube, we do need to remove that trace alloy that we have lining the inside. Now, we put a PVA release agent onto this, so in order to soften that, we're just going to soak it in some water. While that soaks, we'll now look at the wishbone. Whilst this process will leave you with a good moulded surface on the inside of the part, the outside of the part is going to be less than that. As you can see here, we've got a rough textured finish as left by the vacuum bag. I'm now going to do some finishing work on this part to give it a good cosmetic and aerodynamic finish. I'm carefully abrading the surface with 120 grit paper. At this stage, you're only looking to take out any of the high spots left by the bag and provide a key for the coating. You're not looking to completely level the surface. The main areas are done with a DA sander and then any detailed areas are finished by hand. After a quick wipe down with acetone, a small batch of XCR coating resin is mixed and applied by brush. When you're applying this, you're looking to put an even coat as thick as you can get it without getting excessive drips and draining. Now if you do get some drips, these can just be swept away with the brush. This is then left for two to three hours, which is the point where it will have reached its B stage. This is where it'll still feel very tacky, but it's no longer able to move and flow. At this point, another batch is mixed and applied in just the same way. And again, this is left for two to three hours and repeated one more time, making three coats in total. Once the last coat has been allowed to fully cure, the part can be flatted. Starting here with a 240 grit abrasive, the surface should be leveled until completely smooth. Now, this is surprisingly quick to do, and this part took less than five minutes. Once this is done, you can then move on to a finer 400 grit abrasive in preparation for the final coating. And now, as before, any detailed areas around the part can be finished by hand. Whilst you should try to avoid breaking through the coating into the reinforcement beneath, if you do have a few small areas like this, it really won't be a problem if they're only slightly penetrating into that cosmetic outer layer. Once sanded, the final coating can be applied. For that, I'm going to spray a single coat of Phantom 2K satin. Now it just requires one application and it's going to give us a consistent satin finish, but you don't need to spray a part like this excellent gloss results can be achieved by applying a thin coat of the XCR resin. While the paint cures on the wishbone, we can now look at cleaning up the induction tube that we'd left soaking in the water. Once soaked, the thin foil of alloy removes very easily with a soft bristle brush. This tub of water is only used for this purpose, and once it's washed out many hundreds of parts, it could be allowed to evaporate and the residue disposed of appropriately. It should go without saying, but this water shouldn't be poured down a drain. Then a quick dress of the ends with a permagrit block is all that's required to get it ready. So here we have our finished components. At just 12 grams, this induction tube really is incredibly light. And we've got that smooth, molded inner surface that we required for good airflow in the component. In the case of the wishbone, we've got all of the structural performance that's needed for the recumbent trike project. And because of the finishing work that we've done on this, you really would be hard pressed to tell this apart from a conventionally split molded part. But if we had tried to make this with a split mold, we would have had some real challenges. Not only would closing the moulds, getting the laps right be very difficult, but it would be almost impossible to extract the vacuum bag through these very small apertures. But if you're not familiar with that process and you want to learn more about it, then click on this video here where we go through it in more detail. If you do have any questions at all on this process, please post them in the comments section where I do aim to answer all of them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.